Good afternoon everybody and welcome to the next seminar in the FBA series where we're exploring fellows careers to date and some of the key FBA projects. For those who don't know me, my name is Mark Batista, I'm the Marketing and Membership Manager here at the FBA. We hope that you've been enjoying the series so far. If you've missed any of the talks, all of them are now available under the Discover and Learn tab on the FBA website. If you're enjoying the series and you're not already an FBA member, then you can also become a member by clicking the Join Us tab at fba.org.uk. Without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Louise Labictoire. Louise has been working with freshwater mussels for almost 15 years. She began working with the freshwater pearl mussel back in 2007 when the FBA embarked upon a captive breeding programme to rear juvenile mussels from a range of English rivers to save them from extinction. Louise is currently interim head of science at the FBA and is now researching how freshwater mussel population reinforcement should be carried out. So over to you, Lou, whenever you're ready. Thanks, Mark. Okay, I'll just share my screen. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm just going to get rid of that. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, my name's Louise, and I'm going to be talking to you today about some of the, um, the, the projects that the FBA has been involved with to do with freshwater mussels, uh, including their restoration, rearing and reinforcement um, activities that we're involved with. So just a quick note of what we'll cover. I'll kind of just go over a bit about the basic kind of ecology and biology of the freshwater pearl mussel for those of you that aren't, um, aren't aware of the species in, in great detail. Go through some of the, the problems and then what we're trying to do at the FBA and with our partners as well to, to fix some of these, uh, some of these issues. So just to start um, a brief kind of introduction to, to what the freshwater pearl mussel is. Uh, so the species name is Margotifera margotifera, um, and it's a large bivalve mollusk. So, so the species can reach uh, sizes of or lengths uh, of over 17 centimeters in length in some populations um, and can live in very um, densely populated beds of up to 400 mussels per square meter. Um, so can, can live in very high densities. They are a fascinating species that can live to be over 100 years old. Um, and some, some parts of the distribution in, in the most northern kind of colder climates, they, they can live to be over 200 years old, which is pretty remarkable for, a, um, for, for, any, for any animal. Um, it, they're, they're fascinating for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is that they have this um, really complex life cycle, which I'll talk about in, in a bit more detail in, in a minute. But they also have this they're really difficult. It's a difficult species to conserve because they're very picky and they have this uh, kind of extended life cycle. So um, they have this extended juvenile period as well, where uh, they, they don't actually start reproducing themselves until they're about 12 years old, when they're about six or seven centimeters in length. So they take a long time to grow. They take a long time to reproduce. Uh, and so that makes conservation and um, breeding as well of the species quite, quite difficult and time consuming and, and quite a lengthy process. Um, they can produce byssus threads like the, uh, the marine species do when they're very young. They, they lose this ability as they, as they get older. So the really young ones, which are kind of the size of a grain of sand when they're first, uh, when they're first kind of born or drop off the fish. Um, so they, they start to produce these byssus threads to, to kind of anchor themselves into the substrate a little bit. But as I say, they, they lose this ability as they, as they get older. And then they, uh, the only way to kind of anchor themselves into the substrate is to use their muscular foot, which you can see on the right hand picture here, you can see this white area here. This is the, the muscle's foot, which it uses to anchor into the substrate. And they can move around if they absolutely have to, but a happy muscle generally tends to stay where it, where it, where it drops as a juvenile. Um, but if they, if they absolutely have to move, so for example, this muscle on the left hand side has had to move um, in response to this receding uh, water line here. So you can see it started over here and you can see this kind of smile shape here that it's um, started to, to, to move over to this to this side. So if they have to move, they can, but as a general rule, muscles should, should stay where they're, where they're dropped. So just a little word about the distribution and habitat. The freshwater pearl mussel is only found in uh, very clean, fast-flowing, highly oxygenated uh, rivers that have a low calcium concentration and as such low kind of conductivity in circumneutral rivers and streams, so slightly acidic to, to, to neutral streams. They're typically found kind of at the head of riffles um, and in, in habitat that is stable yet um, uh, has, has a good flow. And usually that means that there's, there's gravel and sands underneath a layer of uh, cobbles and boulders on top. So you can see in pretty much all of these pictures here, but particularly on the, on the left hand side there, that 
the mussels actually look like cobbles themselves. They, they, they look like their substrate. You can see it's, it's a very stable habitat. There's no kind of bright, um, bright substrate there at all. And they actually, in some beds, in some kind of areas where there are large beds, they can make up the, the actual bed of the river. It's very difficult to move around in, in areas where there are um, big mussel beds without trampling on them. <clears throat> Uh, so they have a whole Arctic distribution with the most kind of southerly um, distribution being uh, Spain uh, and in the kind of Spanish regions, they, they generally don't live as long as the, uh, the individuals in the northern regions because of the temperature. So in Spain, they can live between uh, 30 and 60 years as a general rule. And then as you go further north and the temperatures decline, their metabolism slows down and uh, they can live for, for, for longer. So 130 is the kind of the typical age range, uh, a, a maximum age of, of, of freshwater pearl mussel. So these pictures just give you a bit of an idea about what some of the pearl mussel streams in, in England look like. So uh, some of the more lowland areas you can see in the uh, in all of the pictures except the bottom left. And the bottom left is a picture of a typical kind of pearl mussel habitat in more kind of upland, upland areas. So to go on to the life cycle, you can see from this kind of diagram here, um, we it is quite a complex life cycle uh, involving a parasitic stage on a, on a host salmonid. So uh, the, the species has separate uh, sexes, so it has male mussels and female mussels. And in uh, early spring, the male mussels will release their sperm into the, into the water column, which then have to come into contact with the female mussel. And as she's doing her normal filtering activity, she will take in those sperm into, into her bowels and uh, the sperm will fertilize her eggs and she'll brood those eggs for, it depends upon temperature, but for usually around six weeks until uh, the, um, the larvae or glycidia, as they're called, uh, develop. And uh, again, in response to temperature, she'll release those glycidia into the wart column and continue um, on the glycidia need to come into contact with a, a host fish. And this needs to be a salmonid in, um, uh, it needs to be a salmonid in the UK. This is generally uh, sea trout, brown trout, or um, or salmon. Although uh, there's some kind of indication that they might also use um, Arctic char, but usually it's it's salmon or trout. Uh, and the the glycidia, I'll show you a video in a minute. But the glycidia kind of have to have to come into contact with the fish, and through the normal uh, breathing um, action that the the salmonids do, they they take in water through their mouth and pass it over their gills. And as they pass as the glycidia uh, pass over the gills of the fish, it snaps, they snap shut onto the gills and the fish then grows a cyst around the, uh, the glycidia um, as it's a, a, an immune response to this um, foreign body that's, that's on its gills. And for some reason, we don't fully understand why the fish would normally slough off any kind of parasites that, um, that, that attach to, to them, but they don't for the freshwater pearl mussel. So the glycidia stay attached to the uh, host fish gills for Dependent upon temperature, it's usually around nine months. And then after nine months, you can see the, uh, the glycidia have grown to a, a decent size in the, uh, the picture at the top there. So when they're about 0.4 of a millimeter long, they will drop off as juvenile mussels into the substrate. And they need to drop into suitable habitat to continue to, to survive from there. And then they'll grow in the substrate until about, again, 12 years old before they them, themselves become um, sexually mature. We can hopefully this works. I can play this video. This is a video of uh, snapping glycidia. So you're seeing here, so you can see here the glycidia are kind of snapping. And what I'm going to do is add a, uh, a small amount of saline solution to the right hand side of the picture here. So you can see that this is what they'd look like in the water column. And then when they come into contact with fish, quite salty environment, they snap shut and they'll stay shut then. Once they're shut, they're shut. They, they can't reopen um, themselves once they're snapped shut fully like that. Oh, some selection of other videos on YouTube there. Okay. So when glycidia are insisted, they look like this. Um, on the top left hand, you can see that we've got a couple of cohorts of glycidia here that have insisted upon fish gills. So you can see there's three kind of in the middle of the, um, of the view there, which look a lot smaller than the other glycidia that are around them. And there's a, a time difference here of uh, females that have released um, six weeks earlier than the ones that are the smallest ones here. So there's a six month, uh, six week, sorry, six week gap between the largest and smallest uh, juvenile uh, glycidia that are on the, the gills there. Um, and we kind of think that um, 
usually it's, it's quite a synchronous event, releasing a book idea and releasing a sperm and all of that kind of thing. But what we found over the years of working with muscles in captivity um, is that actually it's, it's not it's not perfectly synchronous. And so we can have these um, these differences in, in release dates. And you can see in the other two pictures there, the, the kinds of insistment level that we get. So these, again, these are quite large book idea. Um, so these are almost ready to, to drop off. These are about um, 350 to 400 microns in length. Um, so they've grown quite substantially from their original size of, of 80 microns. And you would never normally see this level of insistment in the wild. You would maybe expect to see one or two, maybe 10 individuals per, per fish, per juvenile salmonid. Uh, but in captivity, obviously, we can um, we keep the fish and the mussels quite close in, in, in contact. So uh, we get high insistent levels and we can collect larger numbers of juveniles this way. And it doesn't seem to um, harm the fish in any way. We don't get um, large mortalities of fish at all. Uh, we can see, I mean, the, that individual that you can see in the bottom two has, has at least 5,000 glucidia per fish. And we don't see any kind of mortality associated with that kind of, um, that level of insistent. So, um, they're pretty hardy. Uh, so what's the problem? There are a lot of problems that affect the freshwater pearl mussel in, in the wild. Uh, the main one being land use intensification, which brings um, issues of silt and nutrient enrichment to, um, to pearl mussel rivers. So you can see from the, the two pictures on the left there, these are quite um, nutrified rivers where we're getting lots of filamentous algal growth. Um, and the, the picture on the right hand side, there's a slumping bank, which is just caused by um, stock access into or close to the river and lots of close kind of cropping grazing of the, um, of, of the land there. Other problems that uh, can affect muscle rivers are river modification. So this is um, either straightening of rivers or uh, changing the, um, the course of it or moving uh, boulders out of the river, removing boulders, anything that kind of it modifies the, the, the flow diversity and um, can be bad for muscle streams as well. Not so much of an issue in the UK, uh, but a, a quite a big issue in um, Scandinavian countries is uh, acidification from, from acid rain. So we're, we're not too affected by acidification, but it is it can be an issue in um, Norway, Sweden, um, in their pearl mussel populations. Decline of host fish is, is quite a big one for, for freshwater pearl mussel populations, particularly where um, the, if the muscle population is declining and, and is uh, getting to quite a low density, to actually get insistment on the fish in the wild if, if the fish uh, populations have declined or if they're not present in the same habitat patches as the, uh, as the adult mussels that are releasing glycidia, you can find that whilst there are mussels and there are fish in the same river, they might not necessarily, that, that kind of natural recruitment um, might actually start to break down because there aren't enough muscles to, um, to insist upon the fish that are actually there. Um, other issues can be pollution incidents, which can affect um, relatively small kind of scale areas, but can wipe out large muscle beds um, if, uh, if that happens just upstream of a, of a big muscle bed. Uh, pearl fishing is, uh, is an issue, not so much in, in England and Wales, because the populations in England and Wales are quite um, small um, and pearl fishing is, is illegal, but it can still be an issue in Scottish rivers where the pearl populations are, are larger. A lot of the, um, the populations are uh, potentially in quite remote places as well, um, but it's not so much of an issue in, in, in England and Wales, like I say, because of the low population numbers. And climate change is, is also an issue for, um, for muscle populations mainly due to factors such as uh, warming of rivers. They, they prefer cool, um, cool rivers and also uh, more extreme weather events. So increased incidences and severity as well of, uh, of, of flood events during the, um, the winter and summer, but also at low flows during, uh, during summer as well. If we get um, dry weather events can, uh, can affect the, um, not just the adults, but also the juveniles, which, which kind of live within the, within the gravels for the first five or so years until they're a bit bigger and able to um, move um, effectively kind of between, within the first five kind of centimeters of the, uh, of the interstitial, the, the shallow hyperate zone. So just to kind of give you a, um, a, a visual of, of what I mean by river modification issues. So this is on the left is a map of um, one of the Helmsley rivers in England from about 1860, so 1860s-ish. And you can see the, uh, the, the course of the river is, is broadly the same, but what we had in the 1860s was we had these kind of nice diverse areas. We had some point bars and some, um, some nice in-channel in bars here. We had some kind of slack water parts in the back here, and we had 
the, the channel was also a bit wider back then. So we had a nice kind of diverse range of, of habitats here. And what we see today is this kind of straightened channel, which still has some, um, some in-channel bars and some point bars, but it's very straight. And that affects the, um, the, the flow and the, the speed of flow that, uh, that goes down there. And that can actually scour out mussels and, and mean that this habitat is, is no longer um, habitable for, for the freshwater pearl mussel. So we're decreasing the, um, the amount of habitat for the species and also um, and, and other species as well. So, for example, fish, uh, fish will find living in these kinds of conditions that we have today a lot more uh, difficult compared to the, um, the, the situation on the left there. So this is a really nice um, kind of picture of, of what I mean by kind of changing that flow, um, that flow variability and diversity. So you can see in the picture on the right, all of the woody debris has been taken out of the river and all of the boulders have been put um, to the side of the stream. Um, whereas the picture on the left shows kind of how, how it should be in a nice messy muscle river. And so what we see when we get these, um, these issues that I've been kind of talking about there is that this is the normal situation where we've got adults that are filtering water from the, from the water column and juveniles that are growing and filtering in the, uh, in, in the shallow kind of interstitial layer up to kind of five or 10 centimetres in, in depth. And what we see when we start to get degraded uh, habitats is silt and, and nutrient input and, um, and, and breakdown of filamentous algae as well permeates into the, into the gravel interstices and we get um, mussels that aren't able to uh, survive in those areas will die. And then any that are able to kind of move um, out of these, these areas that um, might become impacted can, can survive, but they'll, they'll be moving up. And if they're too small, they can actually become scoured out during high flow. So you end up losing juveniles due to death, but also um, scouring. And then if the situation continues to get worse, we can also see, um, that we've got mortality of the adult muscles as well if, if things become too bad. And this is where we start to see kind of populations start to, to really struggle uh, where large areas are, are affected by these, um, by these degraded habitats. So what are we doing to fix it? So I'm gonna kind of go through the, um, th there are a lot of um, projects that have taken place in, in England and Wales over the last kind of couple of decades, but I'm gonna focus on the ones that the FBA has been involved with and, and is still um, involved with. Um, and the first one I'm gonna talk about is um, the one which Mark mentioned at the beginning there. So the uh, Freshwater Promisal Arc. So this is the captive breeding program that the FBA runs and has been running since 2007. So back in 2007, the three main objectives of, of this project, which uh, is funded by the Environment Agency in Natural England, uh, were to create an arc. So the idea is that if there was ever a, uh, a pollution incident or some, uh, at an event which really impacted any of the English populations, that at least we would have some individuals from each uh, priority river which are in captivity and therefore the genetic kind of bank of material from that that river is safeguarded so create an arc was the first objective second objective was to capture breed from from those broodstock that we're holding in in captivity in order to increase the number of juvenile mussels that we're um rearing for the for the wild and the third one is is uh, reintroduction or, or reinforcement i should say into restored areas so just to explain the difference between reintroduction and reinforcement um, reintroduction is, is in its kind of purest sense, meaning a reintroduction of a species that used to be in an area and is no longer in that area. So we know for a fact that we've lost mussels out of specific uh, mussel rivers in, in England and in, in parts of the UK where they used to be there and they're no longer there. So if we wanted to reintroduce that species, we would have to use another population to breed juveniles from and reintroduce those juveniles into that area that no longer has the species present. Whereas reinforcements, which is what we're doing at the FBA, is um, a reinforcement of a population which is already there. So we're using um, species, we're using individual populations and only reinforcing those populations with the juveniles that, that come from that specific population. No, so here's a short video of um, so you can kind of visualize how we keep the, um, the adult broodstock. And I should say we don't actually keep the fish and the um, and the mussels together anymore. This was a video from the kind of start of the project. But what we normally have at the FBA is the adults in a in a cage with some substrate in it, 
and they are uh, within a, a large circular tank and the water from that tank goes uh, out into a parallel tank which has the host fish in there so that when the adult mussels release their lachidia the water goes into the uh, parallel tank and insists upon the fish and we find this is really um, quite a good way of keeping the, uh, the, the mussels and the fish it's quite successful. Um, Okay. Oh, sorry. There we go. Okay. So the uh, the juvenile, the sorry, the glochidia will stay on the fish that are in that parallel tank for about nine months, usually, unless they misbehave and drop off early, which I'll mention uh, later on. But usually they stay on there for about uh, nine months and then they will drop off the following spring and then they need to be collected so that we can continue to grow them on. So we collect juveniles using uh, just plankton nets which are placed over the end of the, um, the, the fish tank and collect those plankton nets every day and sift through the, uh, the material in there and extract the juveniles and then put them into one of our um, rearing systems which I'm going to go into a bit more detail um, in a little while. But you can see here the, the pictures on the left hand side um, at the top, they are newly existed. So, so these juveniles have just dropped off the fish and have been collected and are going to go into one of these uh, rearing systems. And then the picture in the middle is a picture of um, juveniles which have been into the heated aquarium system. So they've grown quite um, fast. So these ones are only a few months old, but they've actually got the growth in the size of um, probably two or three year old mussels, even though they've only been um, off the fish for a few months. And then the picture at the bottom is a two-year-old, um, two, almost three-year-old uh, in our tray system. And the picture on the right-hand side shows uh, the cohort that we collected uh, from the River Irt, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail um, in a moment. Uh, we collected this cohort in 2008, so they're now nearly 13 years old. Uh, but this is the same cohort. So, so all of these mussels all dropped off the fish in 2008. And you can see there is a big difference in, um, in the size of, of juveniles. They, they do, they, there is quite a large size range of juveniles, even within cohorts. So oh, this is just a little video to show what juvenile mussels look like when they drop off the fish. So these are just one or two days old. We've just collected these. And you can see they're moving around using their, uh, their little foot, uh, which is the kind of little white thing that's coming out the, out the bottom of them there. And you can see on some of them as well, you can see these kind of two bars, two lines on the kind of the, the dorsal side. That's actually their gut. That's, that's food within their gut. So they've already started feeding, even though they're only a few hours old, as it were. <clears throat> okay, so the various systems that we use at the FBA are uh, so we use a variety of systems. Uh, we use flow through aquarium system based upon the bucket system, which Christopher Barnhart devised in 2006. So these are the aquariums on, on the bottom left hand side here. And just briefly how these work is that um, the juvenile mussels, when they drop off the fish, they're placed into small um, artemia sieves, which are just sort of plastic boxes with a mesh bottom. Um, and they're placed within kind of two which are nested um, in some substrate. And then the water comes into the top of the system. And then the only way for it to escape the system is to um, get into the kind of the bottom chamber, which is just below the, uh, the white um, sealant line there. So the only way for the water to get through is to travel through the substrate with the, um, with the juveniles in it. So you get a nice water flow through, through the gravels and through those juveniles, and then it exits the, um, the, the bottom of the aquarium via a, a standpipe. Um, so that system has been really, um, successful and it can be also modified to um, recirculate. So instead of it, um, the water just flowing through and flowing out and getting a constant supply of lake water, which we get from Windermere, we can turn it into a recirculating system and heat it so that if juveniles do drop off um, at times where they shouldn't, um, that we can keep the juveniles going over winter until it gets to spring. So what we've found uh, over many years at the, at the ARC is that Sometimes because we get our water from Windermere, which is a, a lake, it's not, it's not a river. So it, it heats up quite slowly over winter, but then stays warm over, uh, over the first kind of two or three autumn months. And if it's too warm, uh, the glycidia can grow quite fast and be ready to drop off around Christmas time when the actual water temperature 
in Windermere can be down to, to three degrees in chilly years. So that's not a great situation for mussels to drop off into because they actually stop uh, stop growing uh, when the temperature goes below 10 degrees C. So if they're not able to grow, they're not able to feed effectively. And so we did find over a couple of years that actually we were just losing all of those juveniles that dropped off early. So by keeping the system warm, uh, so about 16 degrees, keeping it warm so that they can grow and feeding it with an artificial um, commercial shellfish diet, which is this lovely green substance over here on the uh, top right hand corner. So feeding it with uh, feeding them with commercial shellfish diet for a few months until the water temperature just increases above that 10 degrees C and they start to be able to uh, to, to feed effectively again. Um, we can switch the system off from recirculating back to flow through and they're able to uh, survive perfectly happily in, in, in that. Uh, for other populations which um, might we, we might only have a few juveniles dropping off from um, we uh, we and and it doesn't kind of warrant the space that um, that, that an aquarium system provides we can put them into a, an incubator type system which is the picture in the top middle but basically they're kept in Tupperware boxes in, in an incubator, which is kept at 16 degrees. And we do water changes on them um, two or three times a week, usually three times a week. And that just means that we can have up to 200 juveniles per tub um, and we can keep a bit more of an eye on them. Um, and it means that we're not cleaning out an aquarium for them when, when there's relatively low numbers of juveniles because the aquarium system can hold kind of 12,000 individuals, roughly 1,000 per sieve. Um, so the incubator system can be quite useful for that. So once the juveniles have got over this kind of more vulnerable, really small um, size, when they get a, a little bit larger, kind of over five millimeters or so, we can move them to um, a tray system, which you can see on the bottom right hand corner here. So these are mussels that are, uh, have been in the tray system for, for quite a while. And this is just a system where it's just basically an old salmon fish egg tray. Um, that's had the top taken off of it and uh, we keep the mussels in there with some substrate that they can bury into and, and write themselves in and we feed water in from the top um, and we keep them there until they, they grow a bit bigger so you can see the, the larger individuals in this uh, right, bottom right hand corner here are actually ready to go into the the flume system which is in the middle the middle picture here um, and the flume system is just a, a system where we can get higher flow through we We've got deeper substrate for those larger individuals to, um, to, to bury into. And it's got a bit more flow diversity. We've got some bigger kind of cobbles and boulders in there to just create some um, a bit more of a natural environment, getting them ready for going back out into the wild. And so to date, we've, uh, we've reared over 19,000 juveniles, some of which are now big enough to be able to carry out population reinforcements with, uh, which I'll go on to in a moment. So we've got, um, no, I'll come into that in a minute. Uh, so that kind of takes care of the uh, the, the rearing um, side of things. So what has the FBA kind of been involved with in terms of habitat restoration? Now, as I say, there's been lots of habitat restoration work going on in, in uh, UK rivers. But one of the, the main ones that the FBA has been involved with in recent years is the Restoring Freshwater Mussel Rivers in England project, which ran from 2015 to 2018 and was a BIFRA award funded project. So the FBA was a um, was the the lead partner in this, and we had uh, four kind of local partners that dealt with mussel populations in their respective areas. So we had Devon Wildlife Trust, which had a couple of rivers down in Devon where uh, mussels uh, are still surviving, and then we had two uh, Cumbrian uh, local partners, South Cumbria and West Cumbria Rivers Trust, and North York Moors National Park Authority, which uh, which looked after the population over in North Yorkshire. And these are the lovely people that worked on the Restoring Freshwater Mussel Rivers in England project. Um, so you can see it's a, it's a brilliant group of people and the, um, not just the habitat restoration, but also the engagement that they uh, were involved with was, was absolutely brilliant. So Kerry Gibson was the, um, the project manager of, um, of the BIFRA award funded project. And uh, you can see all of the uh, various project officers for the uh, various project areas there. So what were the kind of uh, activities that they were all involved with? So, as I said, we, we need to kind of reverse the, um, the, the impacts of, of river degradation o o over time. And so um, there was a lot of work that was put into kind of improving flows and um, increasing flow diversity and to try and kind of restore these rivers back to something like they would have been um, 100 years ago or 150 years ago. So you can see the, the picture on the uh, top right is the, the picture of uh, a small mussel river 
in South Cumbria that was restored, um, as you can see the picture on the, the top left there. So it was very canalized. Um, there was revetments that were keeping water in the um, in the channel, and there was just no scope for this water to to spill out when it rained. And so it was very it was a very harsh environment for mussels. It was too fast, too straight, and there was no nowhere for the water to go. So the channel was opened up again. Um, and there was actually walls either side, stone walls built either side of this channel. So it really was like a canal. Um, and South Cumbria Rivers Trust, Mike West um, at South Cumbria Rivers Trust restored this, this beck, gave it a much more um, natural kind of course and introduced some bigger materials, some of that kind of, you can see bigger cobbles um, introduced there. And then uh, you can also see some boulders going back into Muscle River on the bottom right there, and also sort of creating some flow diversity with some large woody debris going back into Muscle River on the bottom left there. Uh, there was lots of work on farm improvements, particularly in the North Yorkshire area where, um, where it was a particular um, issue, a lot of farm runoff going into, into Muscle Rivers. So you can see here the hard standings that were put in just to try and keep the soil and the um, slurry on the land rather than um, going off into the, the Muscle Rivers. So some excellent work done there. And there were lots of, um, there, there's actually a lot that went on, not just the physical kind of habitat restoration that went on during the Biffer Award uh, funded project. Um, there was also a short term breeding trial, which was um, based upon a, um, a, a method that Evelyn Malkins devised. Um, and you can see Izzy from um, Devon Wildlife Trust here working on the short term breeding program. So what this was, was basically they, they set up a, system that was quite similar to the to the FBA arc down in, in Devon. But then when the juveniles dropped off, they were collected and put into um, small kind of bags with sediment. And then these um, bags were then with juveniles and gravel were then taken straight to the river and and put into areas that had been identified as um, suitable muscle habitat that should be able to um, to, to to allow the high survival of the, of the juveniles that were um, freshly dropped off the, the fish. I mean, the ones that drop off the fish, the, the, they're at the most kind of vulnerable at that at that age and that size. So trying this kind of short term breeding, if we can identify areas where actually mussels will be able to survive, it takes away that um, that cost and that kind of um, very time consuming process of, of captive breeding. So if we can identify areas in mussel rivers that are suitable for this kind of method, then then that's great. That saves a lot of time and effort. One thing which um, was monitored quite closely was uh, so interstitial dissolved oxygen concentration because the juveniles for the first few years of, of life are actually buried in the substrate. So we need the, the, uh, the shallow interstitial layer to be capable of supporting juvenile muscles. So all of the, um, the works that were done um, as part of the um, Restoring Freshwater Muscle Rivers in England project, uh, the kind of pre and post restoration activities um, were uh, kind of correlated with what the dissolved oxygen concentration was kind of pre and post works uh, to try and um, show that what we're doing is actually making a difference to that shallow interstitial layer. And there was lots of water quality monitoring to, um, to, to also inform where the restoration works should be, um, should be occurring and what kinds of measures need to be taken. And also a heavy metal analysis in one of the, uh, the muscle rivers in uh, Cumbria, uh, which had a, a kind of, a, history of I think it's copper mining and and so the question arose you know if we if we do put juveniles back into these areas are they going to be affected by heavy metal contaminants um, and so looking at, at different areas um, and, and assessing reintroduction sites, sites based upon and, and taking into consideration heavy metal analysis as well and these are just a few more pictures from actually I think this is the river so this is <clears throat> pictures from the uh, subsequent project as well, um, looking at um, reducing um, silt input and track runoff in, in the top uh, top two pictures there by putting in drains and uh, deculverting areas so that you're opening up habitat to uh, fish and trying to boost fish populations uh, by giving them more kind of suitable habitat as well. And plenty of tree planting as well, just to try and um, stabilize uh, ground and also just rough up the, um, the, the surrounding catchment so that water is intercepted and takes longer to get to the river, trying to slow down flows and decrease inputs as well. So as part of the um, of that project in 2017, we did a, um, a pilot kind of re reinforcement there where we released 70 uh, nine year old 
juvenile muscles that we had at the FBR. So this is, um, these are juveniles that dropped off in 2008. So they were nine years old when they were released uh, back into, released into the, uh, the River Urt. And they were uh, on average about 33 millimeters in length, ranged in size from 16 to, to 39 millimeters. And we released them at one specific site in, in three different kind of patches within that site. And then the project officer, Chris West, who, um, who works on the Urt, uh, monitored them over time to see um, how long they stuck around. Did they, did they move? Did they get scoured out? Were they, uh, were they surviving? Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that in, in a moment. But you can see some nice pictures here. Um, on the left hand side, the juveniles filtering nicely in the flume. And then you can see the muscles, you can just see the muscles. Uh, so there's one at the bottom of the picture in the middle there. There's one just behind them there. There's also one over on the left and there's a couple at the top over here. So they're really difficult to see. <laughs> even, even at nine years old, re sort of re um, releasing muscles into muscle rivers. If you don't have a way of, kind of monitoring them effectively, you can put them in and and lose them very easily. Every time we go back to this um, this reinforcement site, we we find new muscles that we've that we've missed in in previous monitoring efforts, and it's been four years now. So and they're large now; they're big. They're big muscles. So it's a it's always a challenge. A big part of the um, of, of the project as well was was engagement. So lots of engagement with schools and universities, um, community groups. And we also had a, um, an installation of a, an exhibit at the Lakes Aquarium, which is near Windermere, uh, just to try and kind of get the message out there about what the species is and why we should be um, conserving it and trying to restore rivers. So finally, the, uh, the current project that the FBA is involved with, um, which really kind of is trying to um, address that kind of that third uh, point, that third objective of the, uh, the FBA arc is the reintroduction or reinforcement of, of populations. So we now have a, a four year river urt reinforcement research project with kind of emphasis on the research. And the idea behind this um, project is really to, to research how to carry out population reinforcements for this species um, in one kind of target river. So we've got a cohort of about 3000 juveniles that are uh, ready for release there. Um, so this is a cohort that was released from the fish in 2014. So they're coming up to um, coming up to eight years old now um, and um, well, seven, seven, eight years old. And they're getting to the sizes um, that, that we would expect that they could actually survive in the wild now. And so what we really want to do is to really drill down into what makes a successful reintroduction, uh, particularly in a long-lived species that isn't um, mature when it when it actually goes out into the wild, and can take several years to reach uh, reach maturity and actually contribute to the next uh, generation. So, really, kind of drill down into what makes a successful uh, reinforcement. This project is coupled with um, habitat improvement work. So, Chris West is my partner in crime there in the uh, in the middle doing some low flow measurements in the earth. So coupled with the, uh, the research and the, re the reinforcement measures, we obviously need to continue with the habitat improvement because the air is, um, it's, it, it's, it's still heavily impacted as a mussel river, although there are lots of parts that are actually quite natural. So every, every river is different um, and needs to be kind of treated as such. And having that on the ground knowledge about um, what goes on within the river is, is absolutely paramount. So Chris worked on the Storing Freshwater Muscle Rivers in England project and has been in post on the earth since 20, 2015. And monitoring, um, I'm going to keep banging on about monitoring because particularly with a species like the Freshwater Pearl Mussel, which lives for such a long time and doesn't mature until 12 years old. And you don't know whether the individuals that you've released are, are kind of, are they stressed? Are they not stressed? Are they, are they acting how they should? Because you don't know when you release them, if you release them at eight years old or seven years old, you don't know if they're going to be capable of reintroduction uh, of reproduction in the wild when they get to a uh, reproductively viable age. So monitoring really is key for, for this species. So this project is, uh, so project officers are, are myself and Chris um, at the FBA and West Cumber Rivers Trust. And then uh, the project steering group consists of um, Natural England, the Environment Agency and United Utilities who are funding this work. So one of the first things we did um, back in 2019 when, when we first kind of started was to make sure that, um, that we made as many improvements as we could to the captive breeding side of things. Because for, 
for many years we'd had we'd had some success with breeding uh, but in some years we had we had very little success and there wasn't really a um we, we couldn't put our fingers on what we were doing wrong that would mean that in some years we we had we had great success we had you know 3,000 odd juveniles per population and it's, it was there was good years and then there was bad years and we couldn't quite put our fingers on what what was going wrong so what we did was uh, we introduced the the aquarium system which is kind of a tried and tested system that that had been trialed at the FBA um, back in 2012 2013 and feeding of the juveniles in closed systems so feeding of the juveniles in the um, the incubator which you can see on the left there and also feeding of the juveniles in the heated aquarium system so that they got that nutrition and could grow um, over the winter months in, in warm and fed uh, environments before they were switched back over to recirculating systems. And we saw in 2019 and last year as well, a dramatic increase in survival. Um, so we're obviously doing something, something right there. The other question that we're kind of asking is, okay, well, we, we're using broodstock that we've got from the river, but in some years, well, in most years, we haven't actually rotated broodstock and we haven't, um, we haven't replaced broodstock in most of the populations that we, um, that we hold at the FBA. So actually, what is the, um, what is the, the, the genetic complement of the broodstock that we have in comparison to the wild population? And what is the, um, the genetic components of the broodstock that finally make it to the um, captive cohorts? And so are we um, biasing the, the kind of the, the genetic um, complement of the, of the population when we um, reintroduce or, or reinforce populations with, um, with juveniles from captivity. So that genetic testing is ongoing. The results should be coming in within the next kind of four weeks or so. So that will, um, will kind of inform how we go about doing our, our reinforcement and how many, um, how many different sites we end up using for reinforcements within the yurt. There's also the question of um, captivity or domestication selection. So, are the juveniles that we are breeding at the at the ark are they um, are they actually kind of adapted to conditions in the ark? Are they adapted to kind of the, the slightly easier conditions that that we're giving them in the ark? And and what will happen when we re release them into the wild? Are they going to survive okay, or are they um, are they kind of adapted um, to to this kind of captive conditions? So that work is due to start this year and will uh, finish in 18 months or so. So the second kind of thing we did once, once we'd kind of consider, okay, well, how can we make the, the ARC the most kind of efficient, efficient and effective kind of uh, version of itself that it can be. Um, and the next place to go was really a literature review of uh, looking at um, best practice guidelines for so the IUCN guidelines, but also what's actually been done in terms of uh, reinforcements and reintroductions and can we learn anything from from other people that have done uh, and other projects that have done reinforcements of of mussels but also other other taxa um in the past and what we found was that actually a lot had already been tried with freshwater mussel reinforcements and reintroductions but there was a severe lack of monitoring um i think as is the case with a lot of conservation programs you, you sort of get funding for a three or five year project and then once that project ends the monitoring kind of doesn't carry on um, and that was definitely an issue in a lot of the, the, the projects that, um, that that are ongoing um, or, or that have been have been in the past and one thing which we wanted to make sure that we uh, we could kind of adequately monitor um, for at least one year before the end of this project and then suggest that monitoring actually needs to continue for, for at least a decade after after the end of, of um, reinforcement projects. Um, obviously, you don't get natural recruitment without habitat improvement, so it's all very well and good putting out a lot of juveniles into, um, into rivers, but if those rivers aren't able to support um, natural recruitment, so if those juveniles then go on to release their own glycidia, if those glycidia aren't coming into contact with fish, or if the habitat, the river habitat isn't um, able to support the, the really tiny juveniles that are dropping off of those fish, then all you will ever have is uh, this cycle of captive breeding and and having to do those reinforcements. So really, what you want to do is is to try and couple the the habitat um, improvement works and the the captive breeding. Um, and the other big kind of thing which came out, um, which is quite um, key, really, is is how do mussels react to stress, both chronic and acute. So how how do mussels react to being in captivity? How do mussels react to to being released into the wild? what makes a successful reintroduction um, and how can we measure it? Because mussels 
don't have a lot of behavioral traits that you can point to and say that muscle's stressed or that muscle's, you know, that muscle's happy in, you know, what does a happy muscle look like? So how do muscles react to stress and what can we um, do uh, if we can find a, a way to, to measure kind of stress or, or the success of releases? What can we do to improve both captive reading and the reinforcement procedures that come from, um, from doing reinforcements? So one of the things that we um, started to do um, last year, just before COVID hit, uh, was um, habitat assessment. So really looking at um, the habitat within the river Urt, because the, the Urt is kind of a, a river of two halves. It's got good muscle habitat down at the bottom of the catchment and slightly marginal muscle habitat at the very top of the catchment. But it has uh, brilliant land use at the top of the catchment. It's got a uh, very low input. It's got there's been some modifications of the channel, but largely it hasn't been tampered with too much. Whereas at the bottom of the of, of the catchment, we've got um, more intensive land use. The, the channel has been modified a lot more. Um, there's been a lot of clearance of that kind of large woody debris and that, um, that, that those kind of boulder uh, habitats that are really important for mussels. So we've got this situation where we've got um, marginal muscle habitat at the top, but great catchment conditions and better habitat at the bottom, but not so great catchment conditions. So what do you do? Where do you put your muscles? So we're looking, uh, and we're still gonna be doing some habitat assessments this year as well, um, to see what, uh, what habitats we have available to us and, and where we might put these juveniles back this year and, uh, and in 2022. Um, and in with that, we've looked at where are mussels historically and is the current distribution indicative of actually the best habitat. So the, um, the different habitats you can see in these pictures here, the top, uh, top left picture, is actually um, what was, was classed as being good muscle habitat, um, but it was in poor condition. And the reason it's in poor condition, you would think that the bottom kind of uh, bottom left picture looks to be in, in worse condition than the, um, the, the top left picture. But actually when you kick the substrate in the top left picture, it's so cemented with, um, with sediment. And also because there's revetments either side of this channel, there's been a lot of um, kind of settlement. And, and so trying to put juvenile mussels into, into what is great muscle habitat, but in very poor condition is not gonna be successful. And so whilst the, the muscle habitat is, is good, but it's in poor condition, we wouldn't, we wouldn't try to put juvenile mussels there. Whereas the picture on the bottom right, you can see there is a muscle in this, in this quad right here on the, on, on the bottom right, just here. Um, this, this was classed to be um, potential muscle habitat because you can see there is some scouring there. Uh, you can see there is some sort of that bright kind of um, gravelly uh, material there. So, that's the, so there is some scouring. So it's potential muscle habitat. We know that muscles can survive there. It was a lot looser than the, um, the, than the picture on the top left. Um, and the condition, the condition is good, um, but there is always the risk there that, that small muscles and muscles that are stressed might not be able to survive there and they might get scoured out. So it really is a, a balancing act here that we're, we're trying to figure out what is the best, um, best thing to do with some of these, um, some of these muscles. So last year as well, we also started a muscle silo trial where we uh, put some uh, so we put 25 muscle silos out into the river at four different sites and a muscle silo is this thing on the bottom left hand corner uh, picture so it's just a concrete dome with a, a hole through the middle that so the water goes through the dome by going underneath and up through the through the middle um, and coming out the top of the um, of the silo there and we place mussels into kind of nested cups which you can see on the the right hand pictures there so we've got uh, 10 mussels in each cup and then um, five silos at each site. So we've got 250 mussels out in the river, uh, sorry, 200 mussels out in the river and 50 at the um, FBA as controls. And what we found with this, uh, this was really a, a kind of a question about, okay, well, we know that the habitat and the, um, that the food concentrations dissolved oxygen is, um, is mussel habitat at the bottom of the, of the river, but there were still questions about the top, um, kind of the top half of the river and whether that was going to be suitable for juvenile mussels. Um, so this biomonitoring technique was really useful to, um, to test to see whether is there suitable habitat quality, uh, water quality, sorry, and, um, and food at the top part of the catchment. 
And what we found is actually, yes, the, uh, the, the food quality is, is absolutely fine at the top part of the catchment. We've only had one mortality in, in the whole system to date, which is excellent from a conservation point of view, really boring from a scientific point of view because it didn't show any differences. But it's answered the question um, of, you know, can larger juveniles survive in, in that top part of the catchment? Yes, they can. But what we're um, hoping to do this summer um, is to, or this spring rather, is to put um, smaller juveniles out into the silos to see whether we get the same results in that because those smaller juveniles are more vulnerable. And um, so we really need to test that um, and push the, um, push the boundaries of, of what those really small juveniles can, um, can potentially handle to try and answer that question properly. And we've coupled this with water quality monitoring as well. So we've got some swans in, in the river as well. Oh, this picture just makes me laugh because it's the extent that Chris, poor Chris had to go to to try and uh, find signal in the Wasdale Valley. So you can see the antenna that's on top of that very long pole. Just made me giggle. Um, so one of the other things that we've got planned for this year is a multiple stresses experiment to try and kind of answer this question of what does a stress muscle look like? Um, like I say, there's no kind of behavioral cues that we can uh, really pick up from um, from from muscles. So what does a stress muscle look like? And the, um, the idea of this experiment is to provide stressful conditions for some muscles and ambient for other muscles. So stressful conditions would be high turbidity and um, high temperature for, um, for some of the control groups and test for differences in the metabolites that we see. So using um, a technique called metabolomics, where you look at the uh, composition um, of the metabolites that are within um, tissue or serum or, or muscle blood, um, to, to look at what the differences are between stressed and unstressed individuals. And then we can use those lessons that we, that we learn in this kind of multiple stressor um, experiment to look at further metabolomics testing in uh, when we do releases in um, 2021 and 2022. So do pre-release conditions in captivity affect uh, muscle stress upon release? So can we kind of gear up the muscles ready for release um, by perhaps providing them with um, native water or by providing them with um, a lot of flow diversity and, and a lot of kind of uh, pretend spates in the, um, in the flumes to kind of make sure that they're, they're kind of ready and primed, if you like, for going out into the rivers. Or actually, does that not make a difference? And do we just need to be focusing on getting as many muscles out as possible of a particular size or, or, or age? Um, so you might have seen in some of the pictures, some of the tags that we've got on the muscles here. So, as I said, monitoring is kind of an important thing, um, particularly for a long lived species like Margaretifera. So we've, we are tagging muscles with uh, small vinyl tags, which are the, the numbered kind of yellow tags that you can see there. And we're also pit tagging muscles um, using, um, so they're passive integrated transponders, which um, you stick on to the other valve of the muscle with super glue and then cover them with um, dental cement so that they stay on there. So we're um, yeah, busy tagging muscles as well so that we can continue our um, monitoring. And as I said before, I won't really go over this again, but we're doing some genetic testing just to see, um, just to inform how we do releases uh, in future. So in conclusion, uh, lots of effort has to go into recover damaged muscle populations, particularly of these really long lived species um, that, that don't you know, become sexually mature for at least a decade. Um, and so propagation and population reinforcements are very costly. And it's much better if we can to try and restore habitat to a point where the populations can actually um, repair themselves if, if that's possible. Now with the ERT, that's not possible because the, uh, the number of individuals within the ERT is dropping. It's dropped below 500 now, and we're not seeing natural recruitment in the river. So we know that we need to do um, population reinforcements in rivers where those populations have become critically low. Um, but for those populations that still have sufficient um, numbers, then, then going down the um, restoration, um, the habitat restoration um, route is much more, um, yeah, much more kind of, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We, we would want to do that before we, before we go down the population reinforcement and captive breeding route. Um, so before carrying out any of our reinforcements, we're considering a lot of different things because um, the, the juveniles that we've got without being too kind of precious about it, but the juveniles that we have got are precious and um, they're, they're very costly to produce and we want to make sure that we're getting, we're getting it right. Um, so hopefully the questions that we're going to be answering during this uh, river research project are going to kind of pave the way for other population reinforcements um, of the freshwater pearl muscle in the future.
Oh, I just wanted to mention um, one last time that the people, uh, the people make these things happen. So all of the people involved in the restoration and the rearing, none of it would, would happen without, without them. And there have been a lot of people over the years who have contributed to, to these various projects. So just a, a big up to them. And that's it. I've included references in case anybody wants references, but that's all. Um, thank you, Lou. That was uh, absolutely brilliant. Um, incredibly fascinating. Thank you. Um, there are a, a number of questions that have come through, which we'll try to get done in the time. I'm, I'm consciously aware that some people may need to go, so I'll quickly skim through them. Um, but Craig asks, are there any similar restoration projects underway in Scotland? In terms of captive breeding, because the Scottish populations are um, in better nick than the English and Welsh populations, um, they've rightly gone down the route of, um, of population of um, habitat restoration rather than going down the route of captive breeding, which I think is the, the right thing to do. So I don't know of, of any um, kind of pure captive breeding programs. I do know that some um, populations might have um, uh, Bankside encystment going on where the, the muscles are, um, so a, a small number of muscles are encouraged to release glochidia um, and then those glochidia are, are introduced into um, a bucket with um, native fish that have been electrofish from that river so that the, um, so the, the fish are, are well encysted and there's a higher chance of them releasing um, juvenile muscles into habitat that's um, that's good there. Um, I think there are some um, bankside and system where it's going on, but not captive breeding that I know of. But others might others might know more. We do that. Ah, uh, do you, Chris? Yep. Yep. How long have you been doing that for? Um, since two thousand and fourteen. Um, right. We started off with a pearls in peril project, and then right. we've sort of we've sort of taken it on off our own backs and continued okay. it because obviously you need to keep doing it over and over again. Uh, hopefully this year we'll be doing some juvenile surveys. Uh, right. We have got it to the point where we've seen glycidia on the gills. Yep. Uh, when we've gone back up there, high loading, so it's they're in areas where there's very few mussels. So right. what we're seeing is actually. Uh, as a result of our encystment, we think, because yeah. the loadings are so high. Yeah. Um, so this year, then, hopefully, we should see some juveniles, fingers crossed, but it's going to be a needle in a haystack because it's quite a big river. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's the thing. It's it, If if the habitat is is right, then it, it can it can work. But I, I know of two or three pop, um, projects that have tried a similar kind of thing uh, over the course of 15 years. And because the habitat's not quite right, it, it just hasn't worked. Um, so yeah, it, it's a great technique if you can get the habitat right. Yeah, I think we're lucky because the habitat where we're actually doing the encystment is pretty much perfect. Um, it's a heavily right. hydroed river. Um, so the pearl mussel population itself, um, there's about 500,000 mussels in the river, but 95% of them are below a hydroelectric dam. Yeah. So upstream of there, there's very small pockets that are pretty well scattered and there's about 30 kilometers of river. Um, so we've sort of cherry picked sites where we know A, we're going to catch salmonids um, and B, obviously we've related that to the habitat as well. So um, we've pretty much got it nailed. I mean, we, we get the, the encystment dates pretty much spot on. Uh, a lot of work before that. Um, assessing when the glycidic, when the mussels are going to spat, um, but we pretty much get it bang on every year. Um, it just sort of comes with experience as well. And once you sort of get the first couple of years out of the way, you can kind of predict it. Um, mm. We find that they tend to spat the first week in September. Okay. So we, so we use that as a sort of baseline. Uh, so we start looking at the glycidia sort of the start of August, the end of July, something like that, and then okay. and then deduce it from there. Um, but we get it pretty much spot on every year. Um, so, yeah, it, it seems to be working, but the proof will be in the pudding when we actually try and find some juveniles. Yeah, well, keep in touch and let me know what you find. Yeah, no problem. Well, well done. Thanks, Chris. Sorry, I'm consciously aware that we're running out of time and I have to move things on a bit because oh. there's lots of questions to try and get through. Um, just a quick question from Richard, which which I'd like to answer because I, I, I would like an answer for because uh, I find it intriguing as well. Um, 
he says it's always a puzzle for me every adult muscle is eroded at the hinge point why is this more pertinently does it confer some sort of evolutionary advantage and he says he's sorry it's a bit of a curveball but no not at all yeah no it's uh, yes there is a lot of erosion on the umbro um which i yeah i did have a lovely picture of it i can't can't remember where it is now but yes you do see um a lot of erosion on the umbro uh, you can even see on this juvenile which is you know quite small um still that you've got a bit of erosion here um and it's basically that's the oldest part of the muscle so when the muscle is tiny um, and because the muscle kind of grows on its on its outer edge a bit like a, a bit like a tree, it lays it lays down rings around the, the growth edge, which is this edge here. That's the oldest part of the muscle. So if you've got a muscle that's say 80 to 100 years old, this part will have been exposed to the water for 80 to 100 years. And so because they live in these kind of circumnutrial streams, they um, that part erodes away because of the slight acidity um, and also the friction of being in, in a river for, in a, you know, a moving environment for, for 80 to 100 years. So you get this kind of erosion around the oldest part of the, the muscle, which is the, which is the umbo where, and the, the outer kind of edge is, um, is, is, is not eroded because it's the newest. Um, you can actually, I have read of um, situations where live muscles have been found and there's been a hole right the way through the, um, through, through the shell um, and they've kind of plugged it, uh, tried to plug it with, with calcium, but uh, yeah, it's the oldest part of the shell. That's fascinating, thank you. Um, Alan asks, is there successful natural recruitment anywhere, i.e. self-sustaining populations? Yes, so there is um, natural recruitment, however, so the only English population that has a decent number of muscles in it has natural recruitment, but it's not sustainable natural recruitment. So usually in any one year in an unimpacted population, you'd expect to see about 1% mortality of the population, just as the older ones die and, um, and that kind of thing. And so you would expect to see at least 1% recruitment to keep the population at a stable level. Um, but the recruitment that we're seeing isn't, isn't quite at 1%. So the population is slowly declining still. Um, so yeah, in populations like the Earth, which have fewer than 500 muscles in it, we really have a hard kind of road ahead to try and establish recruitment in the first place, and even then to get it to sustainable recruitment. So yeah, um, in, in England, no, there is no population with sustainable recruitment. In Scotland, I, I imagine yes, in particularly in some of the um, the more remote areas, there's sustainable recruitment though. And how far off do you think we will be from sustainable recruitment? I that... would be surprised if I saw it in my lifetime. Really? Unfortunately, as sad as that is. That is sad. But we're um, trying. <laughs> yeah, we've got to try. Um, Mark asks, is there any experience with eDNA monitoring? Yes, yep, there are primers for, um, for, for muscles and, and eDNA. Um, I know that there was a PhD student, Sam, um, who was doing um, some sp specific um, eDNA muscle work, um, uh, margotifera work in um, Scotland. Uh, so yes, yes, there are primers for it. And uh, yeah, yeah, can be done. And, and it, it is actually, eDNA is, is probably a more, um, a more effective monitoring uh, sampling technique compared to uh, traditional kind of um, by eye surveys in areas where there are relatively low population levels. So it's a useful tool. Um, I'm just going to skip through a bit. Um, Charitas asks, regarding the use of the shellfish diet for feeding juveniles, do you have any issues with lower uptake of algae compared to the uptake of natural cestone or any contamination problems? We haven't seen any contamination issues. Um, they, it comes to us as quite a pure uh, liquid. Um, so we haven't seen any contamination issues. I know that there, there are live bacteria in them because I've grown uh, bacterial cultures from them, um, but it doesn't seem to be an issue. Um, in terms of feeding, we haven't really looked at, at what, they, uh, what they consume. Um, we just know that it works, <laughs> so we're using it. <laughs> Um, and like I say, we, we do stop feeding them when they're in a flow through system and um, they do actually get all of the uh, food that they need out of, out of Windermere when we can switch the ones that need to be on that heated aquarium system um, or, or in the incubator to, to a, a natural um, flow once the temperatures are higher. Thank you. Um, so there's, there's so many questions. 
<laughs> and I'm consciously aware that people will be wanting to leave, but um, we'll skip through as, as quick as we can. Um, uh, bear with me, sorry. Mm -hmm. So, Ian asks, following Scottish adult freshwater pearl mussel reintroductions, we have seen very dramatic short-term losses. Have you seen similar after releasing 70 ERT from your experience? So the, the recapture rate of the, uh, the, the pilot juveniles um, has been about, well, we're up to 33%, uh, which we're actually classing as a success because I'm positive there are far more than we're finding. Every time we go back to that site and, um, and wander around it again, we find at least one or two more mussels that we didn't find before. Um, so having, um, having a kind of effective monitoring um, tool like the pit tags is I hope gonna be a game changer because the vinyl tags are great um, and it can help you track what a muscle, you know, how a muscle grows over time but it's so difficult to find them. It literally is needle in a haystack. Um, and it's a relatively small site, it's not massive. So um, we, you might get some mortality, but I, I, if the muscles are going into conditions that are suitable, I wouldn't expect high mortality. So in the silo experiment, for example, one, one individual out of 250, and, that, and we didn't even you know, put them into the substrate, they're just exposed to the water column water. So if you, I think if you get your habitat conditions right and the muscles are old enough to be a bit more robust than those really tiny, tiny muscles that you just look at them and they wanna die, um, then you shouldn't see high mortality really. Thank you. And, and Alan asks, are you going to reinforce the uh, population even though it cannot self-sustain at the moment? Yes, yeah, we have to. Um, yeah, so we're, we're not at the point where bankside insistment will help kickstart the population. We need to get more, um, more reproductively um, viable juveniles out there. Um, we need to improve the connection between mussels and fish as well, because in a lot of places where the fish um, are, their mussels aren't and vice versa. So uh, yes, uh, reinforcements are needed in the short term and we hope to be able to kind of take a hands-off approach once we start to see um, recruitment, but we need to check that it's, it's sustainable recruitment because like I say, I, I can't see it being sustainable within at least the next 10 years, so. Brilliant, thank you. I think that wraps it up for, um, for this webinar. Would, would you agree, Liam? Yeah. Yes. Um, yep. Absolutely. Yeah. If anybody has any questions that we yeah. answered, feel free to to send me an email. I think my email address is on the website. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so our next seminar will be on the seventh of April, when we'll have Professor Alan Hildrian, who will be joining us to discuss his fascinating career in freshwater science. That is going to be a brilliant webinar. Don't miss it. Um, details will be available on the website soon and uh, we look forward to seeing you there and uh, thank you everyone for coming. Thanks everyone.